Hello, everybody. Welcome once again to another installment of A Rebel Without Applause, coming to you as I always do from my little shrine here in the wood of the holly, my television studio apartment. I have an incredibly special and unique guest to, to begin this next season of my podcast. This gentleman is coming to us from the Black Hills of South Dakota, specifically Leeds, South Dakota. And he has really one of the most distinguished ancestries that anyone could imagine. With me today is Ernie Lapointe, and he is the great grandson of Tatanka Iotaki, otherwise known to most Americans as Sitting Bull, but the proper name would be Buffalo Bull, who sits down. With me today is his great grandson, Ernie Lapointe. Kangisi, otherwise known as Crowfoot, I want to extend to you a deep thank you and welcome to my show. Thank you for having me. And let's just start out from the beginning to kind of give people an idea about this process. When we first spoke, you asked that I send you a package of tobacco so that you could perform a ceremony to, I guess, get permission from the spirit world to talk to me. Maybe you could share with me a little bit about that. Sure. Uh, the reason for that is you know, I, I I did a lot of lectures around the country and around the world. And this is the, the standing order. You know, my wife usually is the one that relates this to, you know, people who want me to talk. Mm -hmm. Because it is a, a gift to the spirits for me to ask for their permission to speak about them or even use their name. And then speak about spiritual things, you know, that, that people ask me about. So it's basically a, a way for me to not cross lines between this world and the next, the world that's unseen, and my ancestors that are over there, that they will help and also guide me for, to answer questions and, and whatever else that uh, people want to know. So that's basically why I do this. Most natives don't do that, but you know, if you're a traditional, which I do, I live my traditional way of life. Mm -hmm. I have a, uh, I'm a sun dancer. I, do, I did my own ceremonies, and I have a ceremonial room here in my home, and I go in there and I have my spiritual items in there and that's where the tobacco is. I put in there and, and I talk to the spirits. I ask them. I says, you know, this inquiring mind is are gonna ask me questions. I says, speak through me if you ask questions that I don't have a clue about. But most of the time I says, you know, I do know the the answers. Mm -hmm. So that's that's why I, I ask for this tobacco. It's a gift to the spirits to for me to speak to you. Well please share with the spirits my gratitude. So you're coming to me from the Black Hills. Uh, not far from Deadwood. And the Black Hills is a very special place for the Lakota people. Well, from my understanding, you know, there's a lot of things about the Black Hills that the Lakota people find special. One of our creation stories comes through here. You know, the, a place down there called Wind Cave. You know, the people went underground when, when a purification came. And they went underground and they came up as there. And then there's another place they call Peshla. It's, Peshla means a bald hill. And they say through there, the, the spirits, you know, help the people understand and come out and, and learn the sacredness of this Black Hills. And we call it uh, Hesapa, you know, it's Black Hills, because of the, from a distance, the, they look black, you know, the, mm -hmm. the trees. Also, you know, it's a sacred place because a lot of individuals were buried here. It's like a burial grounds you know, along the outer ages and, and sometimes on the inside of the Black Hills. And there's many unusual and special areas in the Black Hills that are that have certain values spiritually to the Lakota people, you know. For them to understand, like we have just to the uh, northeast of the Black Hills here is Bear Butte. Mm -hmm. Bear Butte is just north of Sturgis where they used to have the bicycle or motorcycle rallies. But it's a big mountain. It looks like a bear laying down. And there's a story to that, you know, and then you go further west, the Washicha, as we call them, the white man, the Americans come in here and they've seen this big, tall spear up, up in the air. They call it Devil's Tower, which is not what, what it is. So it's, it's a tree stump. It was a tree stump and these little seven girls are being chased by this huge bear. And they jumped on this tree stump and they offered their prayers to Wakantunka, the great mystery, to help save them from this bear. And then this tree stump starts growing. And it grew and this bear came up there and he tried to climb up. You see the, the side of this tree stump. You see where he scratched it. Eventually he gave up and came west east and he laid down. And that's where Bear Butte is. 
So Bear Butte is like our sacred church. Right? So we do go to our our humblechas and our, our purification ceremonies there. It is a sacred area there. That would be northwest of where you're sitting in Wyoming, with the, what you just described, the, the trees. The, the tower, yeah, the, the, yeah. Uh, the Makoti, we call it, or some call it the Shines. I think somebody else calls it the Greyhorn Butte and stuff like this, but it's not Devil's Tower. Right. See, anything that the Americans don't understand, they equate it to hell or devil. So this is these are sacred areas of ours, you know. And and then here in the Black Hills in the center part, you know, towards they used to call it Harney Peak, named after some Washita guy who hated natives. Now they changed the, the, the term to Black Elk Peak, you know, after our one of our medicine men. And that peak is known as in the old days it was called the Owl Mountain because when pre people pass away their spirits launched to travel back to the spirit world from that Owl Mountain, which is Black Elk Peak, and they travel the, the star trails back to the spirit world. You know, there's a lot of places, like I say, that, that are sacred to the Lakota people. We live for the future. We don't live in the past. You know, the past is over. Yesterday's over with. What happened yesterday can't change. You can't say, okay, tomorrow I'm going to change what happened yesterday. Because all you're doing is you're just standing in a circle i mean you're standing still and you're spinning your wheels so you have to go forward and you have to within yourself you know the ecosystem here it balances itself you know the the four legged the green growing things the two legged the river the water the the wind and all these things are part of this balancing the ecosystem but within us we have that our spirit that's in us comes here and enters this body and his body sits like it's, it's home for a certain amount of time. And it has to learn to balance its own ecosystem, compassion, generosity, humility, fortitude, what's in us. The spirit learns these things, how to balance it. And a lot of things in the Lakota culture is humor. Humor is our greatest asset. You know, we laugh at each other. We tease each other. We, we You know, if we like you, we tease you. Oh, good. If nobody teases you amongst the Lakota people, they don't like you. Okay, well, that doesn't mean that they don't, they don't, they don't respect you. Or they don't like you. So that's our humor. But we also have other fears. One of them is fear. Fear is the greatest asset that's controlling the world today. Yet when the Washitu, the Americans first came to our Turtle Island, they came with fear. And they lived it, they, live, they still live in fear, even to this day. The, the, the fear is elevated in their, and that controls these other emotions the generosity, the compassion, the humility, the fortitude, and the humor. Fear overrides it. I mean, you look across this country, how many households? If you're in the lead, there's a guy who lives on a road who has 70 guns. They say, oh, I fear for my life, you know, I have to protect my property. Well, one day they're going to be dead, and that property is still going to be there. <laughs> right. So yeah. Why do you, why do you want to shoot somebody with a gun? I mean, that's just, this is fear. These are the things that my great grandfather understood in his walk in life. See, people say he was a leader, and and see again, the Americans who wrote these books and said all these things, they didn't realize, they didn't understand what the Lakota or Native cultures were. Now, I can only speak for my great grandfather. I can't speak for other nations, but. To me, I was told through ceremony that my great grandfather was not a leader. He was a sun dancer. That's what he told me in a ceremony. And he said he didn't lead people or he didn't like like a president or a general or anything. He was a caretaker, a provider, and he was a spokesperson for his people. And people liked him because of his generosity, his compassion, and how he spoke for the spiritual side of people. You know, that these people need to live a certain way. So he they chose he was a spokesperson. He went before the councils and spoke on behalf of his tribe or his nation. The people just gradually like to be around him because of his ura, I guess you might say. This is what he was. You know, he was a spokesperson. He didn't lead people. He didn't tell them. That's where you have your councils. You have a council member. All these, each little band within the Hukupapa nation had mm -hmm. little bands, had representatives. And this is where Ben Franklin, uh, Thomas Paine, and Thomas Jefferson stole it from the Six Nations Confederacy. 
and they created the Congress and Senate and President and a Vice President because they had a first chief, a second chief, and you have council members and you have representatives from each nation with the six council of nations. They had two representatives and behind them sat with each little tribe that had bands that were chosen to listen in on this, the decision making. But the final back powerful one within the nations, in the Lakota, especially with my grandmother, my grandmother told me is the woman's voice. The woman had the final say in the decisions that are made. And most of these guys who are in the council or who are in certain positions, mm -hmm. a lot of them were chosen by the women, the elders, elder women. They chose these guys because they knew how to balance their ecosystem. Or what I say, they're, they're, it's in them, the compassion, the generosity, the humility and the fortitude and the humor. And they cared for all things, not just favorites or nothing. Even those that they may not like because of the things, they still cared for them. They still spoke with them. They still took them. If they need help, they were there for them. This fear is what causes greed, jealousy, racism, and all that. And see, we didn't have that as Lakota people. And then people, Americans tell me, oh, I'm free. We have no word for free in Lakota because that's how we were when we were born. We're born into this free atmosphere. And there's no identification of who we were. There's no liberals, conservatives, right, left, or anything. We were all just humans. And we had a, a council that you sat together to make decisions for the people. You know, you might have some that had ideas this way and some ideas this way, but they knew how to come to a consensus to a center to actually work it out. And, and the number one value on that is the women had the sign final say on the decisions these men made. If the women didn't like it, these guys who made these decisions were on thin ice. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always on thin ice. I live on thin ice. That's the story of my life. So much thin ice, I'm practically drowning all the time. Well, what you're saying is so interesting because much of the foundational ideas of our own democracy are really taken from uh, uh, the American tribal people. And that, to me, is something that doesn't get the credit it deserves in, in the history books. It's our are the, the basic idea of trying to find consensus. These ideas, really, we can find their origin amongst American tribal people. And as you described it, that's the, the first thing that hit me. Now, you talk about freedom. I mean, we all have our own idea of freedom. But as I read your fantastic account of Titania Iotake, your great-grandfather, one of the things that hit me was the absolute idyllic world, seemingly so, that he was born into before the encroachment of the Wachika or the white people, uh, just this incredible life of under the expansive plains and the buffalo and his apprenticeship from his uncles, how he, he gets his name. He's originally Jumping Badger. Those stories to me, as you related in your book, are really beautiful. It sounds beautiful, but actually it was a hard life. Because everything you do in that time is difficult because you always have to have that, like I just told you without tobacco, you always have to ask permission to pick sage or when you take a buffalo, how you have to honor the spirit of that four-legged brother because it gave its life to you and your family to its flesh to have you survive. And it's every part of him you use, but you also got to honor and respect his spirit. So you eat its liver when you take it. Right in front of the spirit of this buffalo, you eat his liver. Say, it's the most vile part of him, but you honor him because he gave his lot for you to survive your people. So you show the spirit of that buffalo that, you know, I'm eating your liver to show my respect to you. And then after all this is done, even the skull of the buffalo is sacred to us. So I have mine in my in the ceremonial room there. And then the same way with the eagle feathers that we have. Everything that we have in our ceremonies represents that balance in who we are, to understand that we have a, a way of life. You know, they, they call it a culture, but it's to us it's a way of life of, of our people. And it's a hard life, but with humor, we get through it. You know, people ask me this is, you know, people are racist towards you. People, I, I said, we laugh at all. I said, those of us who speak Lakota, because we laugh at these guys. We say, man, you can, how can I lower myself to their level and 
be like them, you know, mm-hmm. or a suit and tie and five hundred dollar Bruno Mali shoes or whatever, and <laughs> and and think you're you know you have degrees hanging on a wall. I have my my degree is my chinupa, my pipe. You know, that's my. I, I, it was a hard time to get that pipe. I had a difficult time. I had to show my creator, Wakantanka, that I'm, I'm going to walk with this pipe with honor and respect because there's songs that everything we do, if you're going to take a buffalo, it's a song. If you're going to go raid a crow camp where it's horses, you have, there's a song for that. You do everything in song. You, you even have a death song. You know, you're going to go into battle or something, and, and then you always protect your soul. So that soul will be intact when it leaves here. It goes back to the spirit world. And you don't fear death. You don't fear the creator. See, this is the, one of the things that, that we were told in the ceremony is, is the American organized religious leaders, they talk about fear of God, fear of death. Well, there's a thin line between fear and humble. The Lakota people, we humble ourselves before the creator. We don't fear the creator. We humble ourselves because it's it's energy that comes to us is what gives us direction in finding who we are. We don't want to be like you. I don't want to be like nobody else. I just want to be like myself. And to find myself, I have to go through life, trials and tribulations. You know, I've been to war. I've been an alcoholic. I did all these things. But these were just things I learned so I can talk about them later on. I was living on, I lived on the streets for four years, you know, from one end of the country to the other with other Vietnam vets, because we did not believe in a system that sent us to war and they didn't care about us. So there was much, much things that happened with us, with me anyway, and in my journey to be, I'm sitting here in front of you. And, you know, on my great grandfather's time, they were a little different, you know, they were harder by what they do, because they didn't have cars, they didn't have electricity, they didn't have all this stuff. But the bottom line is, the, the core foundation of our Lakota culture is our women. But now you have some women that, that don't have that same value. They kind of went off on a tangent. And back in the days when my great-grandfather was here, the spiritual medicine men were always together like this. But now you have the infighting. And then you have those that say they're medicine men, confuse people. It, it all boils down to Muzaska, money. Money is the, I guess you might say, the, the sore spot in a Washito American culture. It's everybody does everything for money. They can't share anything because if they do, it takes away from their money. And all these billionaires and millionaires who are in Congress and Senate, if their money's gone, what's they gonna, I bet you what they're going to do is they're going to commit suicide because they don't know what to do with it, live without money. I've lived on the streets with no money. The only clothes I had was ones on my back and another setting on my back and my sleeping bag and, and rode the freights, you know, and lived off the land. You know, this is this is just one of the, the values of, of being on the street. We learn how to live off the land. You know, we catch animal, you know, four legged, you know, and there were six of us who were native and one had one white guy. He was a, a Navy corpsman and served in Vietnam with the Marines. And he had his little bag with him. And, you know, his medicine in there in case something happens to us, he doctored us. And he was our, our savior, you know, in, in terms of, you know, whatever happens to us out there in flights or whatever. But the rest of us were natives. You know, we weren't all one tribe, we were all different tribes, all Vietnam vets. And, you know, we traveled all over the country, you know, and you know, we go up to Seattle, we go up to Florida, we go down to <laughs> California or Arizona, and we did all this traveling on tra- freight trains. I don't think you can do that anymore. No. Uh, but now, but, but back in them days, it was the Burlington Northern train with, you know, we, the yard dogs, they call them it, on the uh, train stations, they would tell us which tracks, Burlington Northern, <laughs> don't get on Santa Fe or Pacific or whatever it is, they have throw you in jail. So we ride the Northern. And, you know, it was it was a life that, you know, to me, you know, people say, oh, you had a hard life. No, it wasn't. It was a learning trip. I learned that I can live without money. I can learn that I can live off the land. I learned that, you know, even though we were non-vets and, you know, we didn't have any real understanding of the creator or anything to do with the government or anything, we believed in each other. We survived. We were survivors. And that's how we did. 
I mean, most of them guys are probably not here anymore, you know, but somehow or another, Creator had me live this long to, to share my stories with individuals such as yourself. How did you feel about being in the military after your ancestor had fought it so fiercely in defense of his culture and land? Well, actually, uh, what happened is uh, in his time, my great grandfather's time, you know, they, they protected their soul, they protected their spirit with a paint. You know, and John Wayne and all these guys would say, oh, he's putting on his war paint. Well, it's not war paint. It's a paint that protects your soul. So when you, and you, you don't do it to go to battle. You do it when you go on a hunt. Like, say, you're going to hunt buffalo. And there's a million buffalo out there. And you're out there trying to, you know, get one. And say your friend falls off his horse. And there's all these buffalo are running. And they ran over him. And after they get through running over him, you could tip it up pieces. But the paint protects your soul. It's a traumatic event, you know, that he's laying in pieces. And you bet you gather his remains and you bring it home. You bring it back to the camp. And then you understand that what happened to him is his spirit is what you're looking for. He's going back to the spirit world. But his remains, they do a ceremony. And then and then when you wipe the paint off, you're still that whole person because your, your, your soul was not wounded. And... Well, the reason I went into the military was my mother passed when I was 10 and my father died when I was 17. And I was a loner. I was the only child between my mom and my dad. I had half sisters and half brothers, you know, from both sides. But I didn't really connect well with them because we didn't have the same mother or the same father. Right, so right. I had friends, you know, and I know my mother always told me, find yourself. Whatever you do, you have to learn things. Don't ever be afraid of anything. So most guys were afraid to go into the military because of Vietnam. 1966, I was 18 years old and I happened to walk down the streets in Rapid City in South Dakota. And there's a building there with all these recruiters, the Army, Navy, Marines, and I almost joined the Marine Corps. You know, I mean, there was the Marines only one out there. And I told him, I said, well, let me think about it. So I thought about it. I went to see my friends and asked them about the Marines. And most of the guys that I knew, you know, they were older than I was. You know, my brothers were older than me, and they all were in the Army. So they said, the Army, they don't know nothing about the Marines or the Navy or, you know, the Air Force or whatever. So I said, well, I'll try it. So I went back to join the Marines, and he wasn't there. The Army guy was there. So he signed me up, and that's why I went into the Army. And I, oh, okay. I was in. And then I was, again, according to the, the history books and the movies. You know, you have these these warrior societies, they call them, right? But that's not what they were. They were they weren't they were societies, but they weren't warrior societies. So I guess most of the guys who, who went into the military, most of the Lakota guys from here that I know, you know, they're either in the special forces or rangers or airborne. We all jumped out of airplanes, you know, because I was in the airborne. <laughs> and uh I went to Vietnam, I was at the 101st Airborne Division, the Screaming Eagles, you know, and, and a lot of my friends and my cousins, I got a couple of cousins that were in the 173rd Airborne Brigade in Vietnam. And um, as we as we go along there, you know, we, that, that was, I think that was kind of a mental thing in the back of our minds that we want to be in these elite units because, you know, the warrior societies they talked about which is not what they were later on. I find out they're not. They were they were honorable men who were in a group that they call it Okula Kiche, a friendship, a, a group that took to themselves to protect, provide, and take care of the, the people. And, you know, they weren't, they, they could be warriors you know, if they wanted to be to protect, but they were also counselors. And see, in our people, you know, in, in our culture, back before the, the Washicha came in or the Americans came in our area, you know, they always say, oh, the Sioux were the most warrior-like people. Well, they weren't really warrior-like. It was like a game. You had a little stick, call it acoustic, you know? I mean, when the French call it acoustic, you you touch your adversary without killing him. You know, you, you put a welt on his arm or something with this stick, and his friend seen you, your friend seen you, and that's where you got the way the eagle feather straight up in your hair. So that's the question I had reading your book. What that meant was taking coup, C O U P. What that didn't mean killing a crow no, or your no. adversary. It meant something else. And I, could you expand on that? Because I was a little unclear when it, I read it. You just kind of like embarrassed him in front of his people. Uh-huh. You know? And you didn't kill him, but you, you whatever status, status he had, he went down to the lower. He had to work his way back up to there, but you touched him with your stick, and that's when you were honored with this eagle feather. 
up in your, or straight up in your hair. And then as a Vietnam vet, I have an eagle feathers too, but they were saying straight down my back. That's the seventh honor of the eagle feather. That's the lowest honor is because you went to war where they killed each other. And I went to Vietnam and didn't protect myself with the pain because they had put that away after the treaties of 1868. The Lakota people said, we're not going to war against you anymore. So we're going to put this aside, the ceremony. Little did they realize we're going to have World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, and even Afghanistan and in this Iraq wars, that the protection wasn't there. So now what they do is they told me is, is I tell this to young men if they want to join the military. Go to a, a purification ceremony, come on, and bring back the songs of honor with the paint. And you can't paint yourself anymore, but you can paint under your armpits. And that protect. I mean, after the first shower, you're just going to wash off. But the significance of that paint is still there to protect your soul. So if you go into war, you'll be protected. And when you come back and get out of the military, go to a purification, have them wipe it off. You know, and you're a whole person again. So these traumatic events of, you know, killing each other in battle, you're protected. And see, that's what they did when the uh, when, uh, Washichu armies came, the American armies, like Little Bighorn. Most of the, yeah. the, the guys who fought Custer were painted up so that, you know, they didn't have that traumatic event. But they didn't follow my grandfather's vision to the end. Right. See, yeah. that's what caused the, what's happening right now amongst the Native people, the Lakota people here. They, he told them not to take the spoils. Don't take their clothes. Don't scalp them. Don't take their food or horses. Just leave them as they lay. And he says you know, the outcome would be a lot more powerful than what it was. Cause they, and that's what they did, though. You know, I mean, I can imagine, you know, they kept getting pushed, kept getting attacked, you know, at the middle of the night or whatever. And they, the, a lot of the Cheyenne women that were there with the little bighorn, we were survivors of the Washita in Oklahoma who Custer attacked them and killed women and children and raped them and stuff, you know. So they, what they did to him, you know, with sticking that, them sewing owls in his ear so he might have ears in the spirit world. And then they stuck them up his penis because of what, the, what he raped them. And then they butchered a lot of the other ones because it was just the anger. See, this is, this is what's happening right now is the anger. The rage, the jealousy amongst the native people because of that. It's a curse. It cursed, it cursed our nation. And that was a curse that your great grandfather predicted. And that brings me to something I really am trying to understand is the circumstances of Tatanka Iotaki's death at the hands of the, his own know, people. His own people. But I, I think it has to be said that McLaughlin and the agency, the white agency people, created the circumstances to a large extent where this could happen. As you describe in your book, that these divisions start from this moment to this very present day amongst the Lakota people. Well, you know, back in that time, before the, before the Americans came here, if a, if a Lakota happens to kill another Lakota, whether it's over a woman or whoever, it's over a horse or, or accident or whatever, you killed another Lakota. So what they did when you do that is the council gets together and they say, okay, you took a life. He took this person's life. So what they do is they strip him naked and they banish him. And they give him four years. If he survives the elements, most of them usually didn't, don't because a coal or a bear or a wolf out there might get you or something will get you. You know, But if you were strong enough to survive and then once you got yourself back in good position, so you come back four years later, bringing horses and gifts like buffalo robes and whatever to the family of the person who you killed the mother and father, and you ask for their forgiveness, and you give them these gifts. And usually, 99% of the time, they said they would accept your apology or your gifts. But what you do then is you become their son. But you also have your own mother and father here, and you're, you're their son. So the burden falls on you to take care of two mothers and two fathers, and take care of, you know, protect them, whatever. It makes your life hard for what you just did. So that's why they frowned upon this, you know, killing. And when these people killed you know, the native people who came down to my grandfather's camp on the Grand River and they murdered him. I mean, they didn't all do it, but a couple of them did. Okay, when they did that, the minute he's, his spirit left his body, see, and the Lakota culture is like a, a hoop, mm -hmm. well connected as relatives, you know. But the minute they did that, that connection severed. And when that severed, they're over here, we're over here. 
Okay, and they did not get banished because you couldn't banish them. If you did, they would go to Denver or they would go to right. New York or Philadelphia or someplace and, and live. You know, so what they did is, is I didn't know this until I went to a ceremony on Sundays. And the, and the spirit came in there and told me, he said, these people who killed me, you can't go up there and tell them they have to do this. They have to do it themselves. If they're Lakota, they could speak Lakota. They could know the songs. They look it. They look Lakota, but he says they have blood on their hands. And he says when they do a ceremony, they, they might say they're doing a ceremony, a purification ceremony. And, and no good spirit will come in there. No positive energy will come in there because the smell of that blood repels them. So he said, since my grandfather was who he was, a sun dancer who cared for the people, who gave his life for years, sacrificing his blood, sweat, and tears for the survival of the culture, survival of the people, that since they didn't do this, it's four generations. Instead of four years, it's four generations for them to come and heal, do a healing with the descendants, his descendants, which is myself, my, my sisters, and my, grand, my grandchildren now, and my children and whoever, my nieces and nephews. They have to come and say, we want to do a, a healing ceremony with you. Not just say, I'm sorry. It's, it's a, you, have to, you have to live out your, you have to walk your, your 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 sourness because I'm I'm always ready to forgive. Say so sure, let's move on. But it seemed like they don't want to do that. I don't know. I mean, maybe they became Americanized because the Americans said we never apologize for what we do, and that's why maybe that's what they don't want to do. And you know, I've been threatened if I ever go up to Standing Rock Indian Reservation, they would shoot me or whatever. They would kill me and. The only thing that my great grandfather had to do with Standing Rock Indian Reservation was he was murdered there, and his body's still buried up there. And you know, I don't fear him. You know, I'd go up there. You know, I mean, I've been up there a couple times. You know, and and I went to visit my grandfather's grave. And for a long time there, I used to I used to go up there, and it was it was sad because the big grave was. I mean, the mound was there, and you get in, you smell like urine, alcohol. They go out there and they party on his grave, you know, these people. I don't know if it's a, just a Lakota, but it could be from Mobridge too. The, the young white kids would come across the Washita kids and go over there and desecrate yeah. the grave. They'd throw beer bottles and wine bottles and whiskey bottles there. And the whole area was just glitter in the morning, sparkling from all of the busted wine oh, bottles, nice. beer bottles, yeah. Mm-hmm. And they'd throw trash out there, you know, and and it's like, you know, whenever they need something, they always say, we're Sitting Bull's people. And I always tell people, I said, there are no direct descendants or relatives of Sitting Bull in Standing Rock. We're all enrolled at Pine Ridge. Because my great-grandmothers left there in 1891 and went into the Badlands, which is within the Pine Ridge Reservation. And they hid out there for a while until the agency guy at the Pine Ridge Agency brought them in and enrolled them at Pine Ridge. And Pine Ridge is like a big refugee camp because the survivors of the Wounded Knee Massacre, the Minikoju, they're enrolled in Pine Ridge. And there's a lot of Dakotas that came with, that surrendered with a, a crazy horse, you know, the Cheyennes and the Arapahos. You know, they speak Lakota, they're enrolled there. And a good friend of mine, he's a Vietnam vet, but he passed away a couple of years ago. His name was Guy Dolnipe, Jr. Hence the name Dolnipe. He was related to Chief Dolnipe, the Cheyenne. So, you know, they're... they're there's little communities across Pine Ridge, which, you know, identifies the, what tribe they're from, you know, <laughs> or what, 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 where they were originally from. So it's not, it's not only my grandfather that just happened to. There's others that they turned against to our, our spiritual people and got them killed, and they died, you know. And so that's where the division comes from. You know, you have the a complete alienation from each other because of the individuals who, who, you know, you could tell who did something because their descendants cannot attend ceremonies. I mean, I've been with a couple of individuals from Standing Rock who went to ceremony with me, and we went to a ceremony with them, and the spirits wouldn't come in the ceremony because of the smell of blood on their hands. The sad part about this is they told me that after fourth generation, if they don't do a healing, the creator will never recognize them as Lakota people. He said they could speak Lakota, look Lakota, sing songs, dress like Lakota, but they're not going to be recognized as Lakota. They're going to be a lost people. And, you know, it, it, 
it hurts me, you know, in, inside that why can't we heal? Heal that hoop, the sacred hoop, because it's broken in many places, not just in the Lakota, but across the land. Other leaders have been betrayed by their people and got them hurt, or killed, or something, and it has to be healed. Connection has to heal to become a circle again, like we were as one time before the Americans came here. And a lot of the teaching of their values, they last, last on to one of them is the fear. The Lakota people never had fear, but now they do because the Americans live that way, you know, to, to fit into the society over here. You know, and, and I have nothing against education. I, I, I never was educated because I didn't want to be brainwashed by a man's book just to get a degree hanging on a wall so I can. All my work I ever did in my life is OJT, on a job training. I was a land surveyor. I learned that through the guys I worked with. Uh -huh. I drove 18 wheelers across the country, all 48 states, and I learned how to do that on my own. I was a plumber. I was a concrete finisher. I was a carpenter. I learned all these things without going to school. I never would work in an office building, you know, because that wasn't my style. No, no, it doesn't sound like your style. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it seems like there's a, a message there lurking in these grievances. First question, are they past four generations? You're the... No, I'm the third generation. You're third. So there's still some space and time for these people yeah. to offer up their uh, apology, their healing. Their healing. Yeah. Yeah. Which raises an interesting thought. What responsibility do the ancestors have for the sins of their forefathers? Well, I I can't answer that question because it's it's them, not me. You know, right. I, I I looked at my history, you see and you know, on either side of my mother's and father's side, if somebody murdered somebody and they didn't forgive, but nothing like that happened, you know. So basically I I'm the one on the on this end, you know, where right. was, uh, my ancestor was wrong, you know, and I mean, I, I, I have nothing against these people. I don't hate them. I don't despise them. I don't, you know, it's, I know them because some of them are rel related to me, you know, through my mm -hmm. uh, siblings, mother and father, you know, they come from his sisters or, right. you know, because he had all sisters, but a lot of them don't, don't see that, you know, because it was, he was betrayed by his own nephew in the first place, to, you know, to how he got murdered, how he got killed. So basically that relative, them relatives, you know, I know them, you know, and I've met with them and, you know, they they, they come around, but they they back away, you know, I mean, for a long time, they're going around telling everybody, you know, 80s, 90s, that they're direct descendants of Sitting Bull and they're not. When I came out of the work in 1992 to tell the people we are related to this man and and there's no ifs, ands, ors about it. You know, it's time to to reset these records straight, you know. And I was attacked. I was, I mean, they used verbal threats toward me. And I told them, I said, you know, I'm not afraid of you. You know, I mean, been the war. I said, I, saved, I, I served, I mean, I faced Charlie, the cobra snakes and the tigers and the leeches and the heat. I said, what more can you do? I said, you can't hurt me. I said, and if you do, I said, it's your fault. You're gonna to have to answer for that one day in the eyes of the creator, you know? I mean, you know, this, these are things that you have to look at. I mean, I try to explain to people. If you point a gun at somebody and shoot them, you think, oh, well, I'm great. Okay, oh, I'm protecting myself or whatever. And it's, that's not the answer. The answer is one day you're gonna walk down the trail. I mean, most human beings right now are walking down an endless trail. There's no ending to that trail, but into the abyss of suffering. I mean, there's no heaven or hell. The hell is what they create for themselves. You know, Lakota culture, this is who we are. That's why we, we kept that balance within ourselves. I don't associate with many people. I don't have friends because I don't want to call people friends. Because if, they, if they're set in this little capitalistic ways of the Americans and they're stuck in there, they don't want to come out of there because that's their livelihood, they think. But that rut they're in has no direction back to the spirit world for that soul that's inside that body. I don't look at people's outside, their skin color or who they are. It's their spirit that's in there. Spirit has no color. And that spirit was just like me one time. We knew each other in the spirit world. We all knew each other in the spirit world. We just came in different parts of this land to learn how to balance that ecosystem within ourselves. That's the knowledge that spirits can carry back to the spirit world. 
And through through ceremonies of atonement, we come four times as a spirit. And at the end of the fourth time, we should have the the package of understanding who we are as a soul mm-hmm. to be able to carry that the values back to the spirit world to be who we are. So this is who we are as as Lakota people to understand and to share. And you know, there's a lot of a lot of us have different callings. Not everybody's a medicine man. They all want to be medicine man, but I'm medicine man that I knew don't want to be one. It's it's a hard life. <laughs> it's the hardest life because they have to be center line. They cannot criticize or they cannot refuse somebody because they don't like you or you don't like them or whatever. And it's a hard life. And most of the stuff they do, they're running themselves raggedy into the ground. Most medicine men that I ceremony was tell me these things. But there's others that get called for things like like with me. I was chosen to be a messenger. They said, share this message with the people. Do not have fear. Do not have fear. Do not fear anything. Okay, that's what I was taught as a child growing up. Do not fear anything. Because if you have fear, there's an entity in Lakota we call Wakashicha, a sacred bad that likes to control the emotion. And it it's negative. It, it likes to draw negative energy into your soul, into your mind. Wakashicha controls your, your thoughts. And you go off on a tangent. And you're something that you shouldn't be. You're caught in this rut you can't get out of it you can't let it go most americans when they when they let go of the fear mm-hmm. you become balanced other guys call them a wimp or pussy whipped or something <laughs> they, i've been they, called that <laughs> the, the greatest emotions that what Kantanta loves is humor and the tears of a man and the man to have ultimate respect for the female because the female is the one that got the wisdom you know i'll tell you a story real quick Go ahead. When the first man and the first woman were, were created, there was nobody else, just a man and a woman. And they're both standing there naked. And here comes the creator. And he told him, he says, I have two gifts. He says, your choice is yours. So he told the man, he says, the male, I'll give you the first choice, he says. The first gift I have, he says, is your urinate standing up. But he said, okay, well, I'll, I'll take that. I'll take it. Yeah. And he says, you want, you don't want to hear the second? He says, nope. He says, this is <laughs> What then? So he said, okay. So he told the female, he says, See, since he took the first gift, you're Nate standing up. The second gift is yours. She said, that's wisdom. So <laughs> a couple of days later, there's a man come and told the creator, he says, you know what I learned too? He says, what? He says, I can urinate sitting down too. <laughs> 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 See, so that, that, that's just a humor there that, you know. <laughs> that's right. We're, we're all united as humans, uh, despite whatever our um, tribal affiliations are well kanji si crowfoot ernie lapointe this has been really a, a fantastic conversation for me a journey into not only your cultural world but just your world as an individual i, I want to say thank you to lamaya yellow did i say it right bilamaya yellow bilamaya yellow bilamaya yellow yeah which means thank you. Yeah. As you said earlier, that these translations from English into Lakota are a little clumsy, but you know, when you just say the words, you sort of feel things that you might not say if you said sitting bull instead of tetanka yaki. It, it has it resonates in a way that the English words can't take you to. Then with us, when we're done conversing, we always say toksha ake. That's short for toksha ake wa chiyankikte. There's no word for goodbye. We say, Toksha Akez, I'll see you again. We may never see each other in this life again, but we'll sure see each other in the spirit world if we get there. Toksha Akez? Toksha Akez, yeah. Normally what I say as my goodbye is Namashaloha, which is Namaste, Shalom, and Aloha. It's my own word. But for the purposes of this show, I want to thank you again in English and say, Toksha Akez. Okay. Okay.